This is the Eric John Phelps Show on 24-7 World Radio. And now, Eric John Phelps. Welcome. And again, I say welcome to the broadcast today of 24-7 World Radio on this uh, overcast and drizzly Friday here on this 13th of January 2023 from the bustling metropolis of Newmanstown, Pennsylvania. Welcome again to the broadcast. Uh, today is going to be the day for Ireland. Lord's placed it upon my heart to deal with it the first hour, reading from a tremendous work titled The Jesuits, Their Moral Maxims and Plots Against Kings, Nations, and Churches, published in 1881, the author being the great James A. Wiley, a Scottish Presbyterian theologian and historian. He also wrote The History of Protestantism in three volumes, and uh, he has a tremendous chapter 15 in volume two, I see, on the Jesuit order, it's some 11, 12 pages. I put it in the back of my book, Vatican Assassins, to re- reference. But I never read uh, Wiley's work on the Jesuits itself. So I spent the last two days reading it, and the last two chapters have to do with Ireland. And since I'm going to have Brother Sean Hanlon on with me the second hour, I thought that would be a nice forte into Brother Sean being with us, and he'll give us an update on what's happening in Ireland and how the Jesuits are continuing to destroy it and do what they do best, to reduce all nations to the temporal power of the Pope, driving them to desperation, poverty, and uh, superstition, lies in every field. So... It'll be my readings to you the first hour and then Brother Sean in the next hour. So I trust the Lord will lead me to the right places here in these last two chapters to read to you for your edification and further information and furthering education, by the way, in the matters of the Reformation versus the Counter-Reformation. And I have one more thing to add, and that is this great, good, and godly man, James A. Wiley, did not see the Jesuit orders coup de gras <clears throat> that they would be uh, issuing, that they would impose on the Protestant English-speaking world of Great Britain, the Commonwealth, and as well as Northern Ireland, as well as America, Canada, Australia, the great English-speaking Protestant nations that were the foundation for Western civilization, the white Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxon, racially Anglo-Saxon Protestant Western civilization, the ones responsible for getting to us the Reformation Bible in its epic work in great English language called the AB 1611, in its present edition of 1769, the King James Bible, who, by the way, King James was poisoned. Wiley says he was poisoned so that the Jesuits could get rid of him and put his son, Charles I, on the throne, who just married a Roman Catholic, Henrietta Maria from, what was it, France. Wiley did not see that the Jesuits were going to replace the Reformation Bible with another Bible. It would be the English Revised Version of 1885, this is four years after Wiley finishes his great work on the Jesuits, and then they would also put the American Standard Version on historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America in 1901. You fill these historic white Protestant nations with these fake Bibles, with these satanic Bibles, these translations from satanic Greek texts and satanic Hebrew texts. You do this, it's all a result of our criticism, 
you do this and you undermine the Protestant Reformation and you can never have a return to what it was because you have departed from the foundational book, the indirectly inspired AB 1611 of, of the English speaking peoples who gave that to the world because it's a translation from the directly inspired Hebrew and Greek scriptures. And so it's the word of God in English. And you take that away from Western civilization, white nations, and you are gradually destroying the Reformation left to itself. I mean, you don't need any help. Now you add some political conspiracy in there with a host of other things. You add that to it and you have the absolute destruction of Western civilization, the Protestant Reformation, and the Jesuit orders victory of restoring all nations to his political temporal power while crushing out the light of the glorious gospel as a public thing. Okay? Wiley didn't see that. But he said many things that were true, so I want to read to you from the 19th chapter of his great work, The Jesuits. And you can get this online from Kessinger's Legacy Reprints. They have Kessinger's uh, Legacy Reprints. It's a wonderful company, and they have some wonderful books that have been reprinted on the Jesuits and other things. So get it from them. Okay, chapter 19 in Wiley's work, The Jesuits, has to do with Ireland. Ireland, it's half centuries drilling in ultramontanism. Ultramontane means over the mountain. Over the mountain out of, from Austria into Italy, okay? Um, in other words, conforming that nation or that people to absolutist Romanism, which is ultramontanism. The Jesuits were ultramontanes when they brought the Nazi party to power in Germany. Ultramontanism is the dark age absolutism, the absolute rule of the papacy over you, your country, your town, by way of the priests. Okay, <clears throat> Ireland has been variously spoken of as the Isle of Saints and the Poland of the West. These are modes of speech which attribute moral qualities and political conditions so widely different as to make it hardly possible for us to accept them as a truthful description of that same country, at least at the same era. There is an order of sanctity about the first, which it is difficult to reconcile with the flavor of revolution which invests the second. Remember, Island of the Saints versus Poland of the West. And yet it is if, and yet, if some considerable latitude and point of time be allowed us, it would be easy to show that both designations are perfectly applicable to the sister island. And I, Wiley is from Scotland, and so he's referring to Ireland as the sister island. Okay. In the early ages, that is, in the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th centuries, Ireland was the seat of a pure scriptural Christianity and the home of a people renowned for their civilization and their many virtues. Have you ever heard that before? Some attribute this to one of the apostles going into Ireland and Ireland became the Emerald Isle. Ireland became a an outpost for evangelism in the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries. Ireland was rich in gold, and so it could finance their evangelistic ministry. And so the devil would have a solution to that, and that would be, it would be invaded by the power of the papacy, and would be set at naught, and finally, without, with uh, William the Conqueror's invasion of 1066, that would finish it off completely, and it, they would seek to not only absolutely Catholicize it, but to replace the, Eng the common law in England with the Roman civil law, and that's 
the invasion of 1066 into England. But Ireland had already fallen to the papacy, <clears throat> and it had one at one time been a great evangelistic nation that was wealthy. We go on. And the home of people renowned for their civilization, their many virtues, the fame of their schools, of their learned men, and their humble and holy pastors was spread throughout Christendom. Ireland in that age was the Isle of Saints, saints not by the oil of Rome, but by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But the blissful youth of the sister country has receded far into the past. The golden age has been followed, alas, by the iron one and the, quote, Isle of Saints, unquote, of the seventh century is the, quote, Poland of the West, unquote, of the 19th. Remember, Poland is the, was the poverty-stricken, fanatically Roman Catholic country of bordering Germany at this time in 1881. Hence, so Ireland was a Poland of the West. Do not start, kind reader, as if we were about, after the fashion of the hour, to exhaust the whole vocabulary of declamatory vituperation in denouncing Saxon injustice and Saxon oppression. In other words, don't blame the English for the, the fall of Ireland. It's poverty. We shall have to speak of tyrants, it is true. Tyrants who have gone forth in the garb of the patriot and the mantle of religion, greedily to make a spoil and cruelly to tear in pieces, weeping crocodile tears while the, uh, the while over the victims, tyrants who have labored to rear their own vile ascendancy upon the ignorance, the enslavement, and the woes of a once enlightened noble people. But that tyrant is other than the Saxon. Ireland is the Poland of the West, quote unquote, because like the Poland of the East, it has to lay its ruin mainly at the door of the Jesuit. And remember, Poland was, was a Protestant nation as a result of the Reformation. The Jesuits killed out the Reformation out of Poland prior to and during even the Thirty Years' War. We go on. We read. One may miss, this page 106, one may miss the solution by too much as well as by too little ingenuity. Our statesmen have been digging 50 fathoms down in search of what is on the surface. In other words, what Ireland's problem is. They have been looking to the ends of the earth for what lies at their feet and which they might have for the picking up would they but condescend to stoop. They have been exhausting the mysteries of statecraft and the powers of philosophy and discovering what any man who has sense enough to count his ten fingers could tell them. Why is this? The truth is, our statesmen do not wish to find out this secret. You know why? Because the British statements that statesmen at this time were Catholics and they were uh, in the pocket of Rome. And the last thing they ever wanted to do was blame Rome for this. Kind of like America today, run by the papists, whether it be the left-wing socialist communists or the new right ultramontane quasi-fascists like Roger Stone and C. Bannon and all those other sinners putting Trump in office. All of them work for the Pope. Going on, they know very well and what they know very well where and in what it lies, but they seditiously, sedulously avoid turning their eyes in that direction, lest they should see it and be compelled to confess it and forced to grapple with it. That is the reason why the case of Ireland is still a mystery. He goes on, he talks about the mystery and for the things here, he says, page 108. The whole case of Ireland may be stated in a few words. A system dominant over conscience and reason, a system at war with industry, order, and liberty, binds down the people in serfdom and misery. The priests of that system are discontented because they are not dominant, and the peasantry are insurrectionary because misled by priestly declamation. They mistake their oppressor and cry out against England. The evils of Ireland are multiform and manifold, but their root is one, and that root is popery. Popery. 
The reason why Ireland is the great, the most degenerate white nation on the face of the Lord's flat earth is because of popery. It's not because the Irish are not intellectual. It's not because they're, they're, they don't have the ability to excel. It's because of the religion of popery that's brought immoral wickedness into that country and dumbed them down. Because remember, sin makes you stupid. Sin dumbs you down. Sin renders you incapable of rational, creative thinking. And to the degree of Romanism in your country is the degree of stupidity, dumbing down immorality of your country. We go on. If the reader should doubt it, we, we crave his attention to the following brief statement of historical facts. In 1796, an order arrived from the cardinal prefect of the propaganda at Rome to the effect that a thorough training in ultramontanism should be provided for the people of Ireland. Rome was then planning those efforts which she had ever since been steadily prosecuting for restoration, her restoring her dominion in, Christ in Christendom. So deeply shaken, first by the revolution in England in 1688, that's called the Glorious Revolution, by the way, where not one drop of blood was shed. That's when James II was driven from the throne. And next by the revolution in France in 1789, now that would be caused by the Jesuits due to their suppression. And so it's going to be payback for France, who had suppressed the order, and other nations. All right, brother Eric, back in a moment, 24-7, World Radio. This is The Eric John Phelps Show on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Join me every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the German Bible Truth Hour and at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Dutch Bible Truth Hour on 24-7 World Radio. This is Brother Nicholas. Ich lade euch herzlich ein, mich anzuhören jeder Dienstag am 2 Uhr nachmittags amerikanische Zeit für die deutsche Bibelwahrheitsstunde und 3 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit für die niederländische Bibelwahrheitsstunde am World Radio 24-7. Dit is Bruder Nico. U bent hartelijk uitgenodigd om elke Dinsdag om 2 Uhr amerikanische Standardzeit het Duitse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen en drie uur Amerikaanse standaardtijd het Nederlandse Bijbelwaarheidsuur te volgen op 24-7 World Radio. This is 24-7 World Radio and you're listening to The Eric John Phelps Show. The Jesuits, we are in... Chapter 19, Concerning Ireland's half centuries Drilling in Ultramontanism. So we read on page 109. We see that the priests were busy indoctrinating the Irish in what he calls the same anti-social, anti-national dogmas. And so Romanism is anti-national. It's anti-nationalistic. So today, could we see the Jesuit agitation in America by calling people nationalists as a something that's to be ashamed of when the God instituted nationalism in Genesis 10? We go on page 110 here. And Wiley writes there, never was contrived and set a-going a more powerful and complete instrumentality for enslaving a people than this. No noise accompanies the working of its mechanism. The world neither hears nor sees it. Nevertheless, day by day and year by year, it pursues its work with noiseless, pauseless diligence. And that work is to build up the temporal sovereignty. That's called the political rule. Temporal power means political power. The right to rule your government. You don't have that right. Only the Pope has the right to rule the government, boy. 
to build up the temporal sovereignty of the Pope in Ireland to establish canon law. Uh, papacy has what's called canons. Those are statutes governing the papacy. And they call this canon law. To establish canon law in the room of British law and to bind down the people in slavery by the most effectual of all methods, even that of enslaving the conscience. So it talks about a particular gentleman here, Reverend Robert J. McGee. He discovered the secret diocesan statutes. He committed them to Cambridge and to Oxford, I believe, to, for their libraries. And in that, this gentleman said, the report thus verified and attested was a com compend, a compendium or, a, or assembly of the documents lodge showing that the papal laws surreptitiously set up for the government of the Irish people and the machinery by which the Pope contrives to make himself the real ruler of Ireland. Okay. Gives a footnote for it. Goes on to page 111. He says, we have seen the machinery construct constructed for the indoctrination of priests and people in Ireland, but a yet more important question remains. What was the subject matter of that indoctrination? The subject matter of indoctrination was the whole body of Roman law, which has been published by the hierarchy. Remember, the Roman hierarchy is nothing more than the Roman Senate. Instead of calling them senators, they're called cardinals or bishops. They are political governors, political rulers, financial governors, academic governors, all under the guise of their pagan Babylonian religion called Roman Catholicism. So we read, we read here. And put in force in Ireland for the government of his people. These include some of the most tyrannical canons. A canon is a statute of Rome. Tyrannical canons on the statute book of Rome, and among others, some which she dare not publish and put in force in some popish countries because their governments have forbidden them on the ground that they would subvert the authority of the sovereign and destroy the liberties of the people. In short, upset everything in the kingdom. But the greater tolerance of the British government has suffered to be published what other governments have placed under ban, and the consequence is that Ireland is more rigorously ruled by papal law than most popish countries on the continent. You know why the British government permitted this? Because the Jesuits were running it. And the Jesuits ran the British government to the detriment of the Irish people in Ireland. Irishmen need to understand this. The Jesuits have ruled Great Britain since no later than King George III. And everything that government does in England, especially during the 19th century, was all to the detriment of the people of Ireland. And those poor souls, brainwashed by the priests, thought it was Protestant England doing it to them. When it was not the Protestant peoples of England that was doing it to them, or the Scotch. It was the government of England doing it, run by the Jesuits. That's why they brought about the potato famine. That's why they exported meats and vegetables out of Ireland of eight freighters a day, thereabouts, to foreign ports to starve the Irish people, to drive them to America, to then be given places of power in the north primarily in preparation for the War of Northern Aggression. All this was done by the Jesuits to use the Irish because the Irish remained to be fanatical Roman Catholics because, because the effect of the gospel had been crushed out of Ireland due to certain massacres, and particularly the Irish massacre where they were massacring the Protestants from 1641 to 1649 for eight years until Cromwell came up there, thank God, and put an end to it. So we read... So Ireland, the consequence is that Ireland is more rigorously ruled by papal law than most popish countries on the continent. Thank you, Jesuits, running the British Parliament. We go on. We read here on the bottom of page 111 to the top of page 12. That the supreme sovereign of the country is the Pope. That the highest law, the only one really morally binding, is canon law. That Protestants have no right to live in the country. 
and no right to own an acre of it, that the soil of Ireland is the inalienable heritage of the Irish people. This is what the Irish people are being taught by the priests at this time, being Romanists, and that despite all changes and transferences of it, however sanctioned by sale or bargain or act of parliament, it ought to be restored unconditionally to the church so far as she formerly possessed it, and to the Irish people being descendants of the Romanist families that owned it in former ages. This is the sum of what is taught the, the priests in their four annual conferences and which the priests teach the people month by month in the confessional. And by the way, when you advocate doing away with landlords, that's communism. That's what Mao Zedong did. He did away with all the landlords. Killed thousands of them. This is a communism is a very cloaked brand of ultramontanism that the Pope secretly rules your country, but there's no middle class and there's no property ownership. There's universal equality in paganism and ignorance and in a Catholic country in Romanism. Going on. We read. Talks about... Um, How Ireland was given. Oh, we talk about the Irish agitation. Page 112. Irish agitation. As regards the point especially prominent in the present Irish agitation, this is in 1881, namely the occupancy or rather ownership of the land, it is important to remark that it is a question on which canon law has very distinctly pronounced. The general question touching the restitution of landed property, which had been owned by the church or by her lay members is ruled by a brief this is a method of speaking of the pope a brief of benedict the 14th endorsing a decree of the congregation for the propagation of the faith that's the inquisition issued in 81630 this brief sets a hedge around all such property and warns pirate infidel and heretic that's protestant that it is at his peril should he appropriate a single acre of it and should he dare violate the pontifical prohibition, he is commanded to restore promptly and unconditionally what he has improperly seized, impiously seized. This is one of the edicts in force in Ireland. But further, the bull, Urum Antebarum, declares that property taken by heretics from members of the papacy, whether clergymen or laymen, is not to be protected by any covenant or prescription, but is to be restored to its original possessors. The bull of Pius IX, this is the Pius, this is the Pope that oversaw the assassination of Lincoln. Um, Apostolica Sedis, quoted in a previous chapter, pronounces excommunication on all who retain such properties. In this comfortable doctrine, the priests fully accept and are careful to tell the people what are their rights under this bull and how carefully the church, quote unquote, guards for them the heritage of their fathers. There has been no concordat, says the Popish Bishop of Kerry, ceding the property of the Catholic Church to the British Crown or sanctioning its secularization. The Church does not allow a state of limitation to bar our claim. Our right is in abeyance. That means it's waiting to be enforced. It is unimpaired. The author then goes on to say, the original gift of this land to the Irish by its maker has not been recalled by his vice regent on earth. Of course, that's the Pope. In other words, the Pope has no right to the land of Ireland, and yet he claims it all. And by the way, it's the Jesuits who are behind the constant agitation, the Indian agitation in this country. You've got to give the land back to the Indians. And yet it's the papacy that has demoralized the American Indians with all the alcohol and also with their uh, gambling casinos. And the purpose to take the land is to further wreck the Protestant Reformation to take the land from the Anglo-Saxon peoples who, who hold it, and who hold it as a matter of treaty, and who, and who uh, well, that's another topic. I'll get into that one of these days. It's all about counter-reformation. You think the Pope papacy cares anything about the American Indian? Of course not. He wants to destroy American liberty brought about by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and Baptists. Going on, we read page 115. 
We behold here the root of Ireland's miseries. With these facts before him, and we repeat that the proof of these facts exists in overwhelming abundance, can any man doubt that we touch the source of all her mischiefs? The secret diocesan statutes of Leinster, the diocesan statutes of Dublin, the numerous documents of similar character which Dr. McGee deposited in the English universities and in Dublin University to remain there, the monuments of the conspiracy of the papal hierarchy against the throne and nation of England. Okay. He talks about what Ireland has become. When we think of what has been going on in Ireland these last 50, these 50 years, the course of nature must change and a miracle must be wrought to sever the link between cause and effect before anything else can happen in Ireland save just what has happened, even a state of things which the Times, now that's the London Times, I believe, describes as, quote, a more frightful picture of triumphant anarchy than can be found in any community pretending to be civilized and subject to law, unquote. So, we read. There can be no settlement of the question, no cessation of the agitation. They do not pledge themselves to stop even here, but short of it, they certainly do not intend to stop. This secured, this secured, it would become a new point of departure for effecting the separation of Ireland from Great Britain. Remember, this is written in 1881. The separation of Ireland from Great Britain takes place in 1922, and the Jesuits will use certain of their agents, some of them well-meaning, like Michael Collins Piper, and then when they're done using him to separate Ireland from England, they'll shoot him with a long-range assassin. Going on, now we're going to chapter 20, page 117. Page 117. Well, Mr. Froud on 116. Froud is a great English historian. In his supplementary chapter to his new edition of his English in Ireland, quote unquote, Mr. Froud writes, quote, the land tenure is not the real grievance in Ireland. It is merely the pretext. The Jesuits do this all the time. They always have an upfront grievance, but that's the pretext for something else. They, they pulled the same exact thing in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, actually starting in the 1930s. The Jesuit John Lafarge. They'll take a pretext and use it for a justification of a policy that the Jesuits have wanted to impose for years. That's what I've always taught. The Jesuits have an open but false policy. The false policy is a pretext, but it has a secret but true policy, what they really want to bring about. For example, you think the Jesuits care at all about the black man in this country? You think all the fighting for universal equality was really for the benefit of the black man? Or was it for the degeneration and destruction of the white man? That's the real policy. The land tenure is not the real grievance in Ireland. It's merely a pretext. The real grievance is our presence, our Protestant presence in Ireland at all. They want to de decimate any Protestantism in Ireland. And if you read the book, The Last American, written in 1900, it tells you they're foretelling that all the Protestants would be killed in 1907. Now, that didn't happen, but they were planning on it. Reformation versus Counter-Reformation. The continuation of the Protestant Reformation and liberty and national sovereignty and blessing versus the restoration of the Pope's Dark Ages with feudalism, communism, socialism, no, no middle class, and of course the decimation of white peoples. They gotta go. Chapter 20, Ireland. The many maladies and its one cure. But we are not reminded, but we are reminded that there are more things than one wrong in Ireland. Priestcraft is not the only scourge of that unhappy country. There are other grievances beside which afflict it. This we frankly admit. It is not one thing, it is everything that is wrong in Ireland. Landlords are at fault. Of the landowners of Ireland, how many are absentees, spending the revenues of their estates out of the country? They are strangers most of all in their own lands. 
and would not know the faces of their tenants, even though they saw them. There are other landlords who live, indeed, in the country, but who shirk the duties of their position, never dreaming that they were sent into the world for any higher purpose than to hunt, to shoot, to fish, and to enjoy themselves. And then there are landlords who tyrannically use the right of eviction against their tenants. Not a few of those who bought their lands under the Encumbered Estates Act, quote unquote, have been chargeable with this harshness and cruelty. And they brought their properties as a bought their properties as a profitable investment. They had bought their properties as a profitable investment and a profitable investment they intended to make them. Yeah. Back in a moment. Maladies in Ireland, and there's only one cure. Back in a moment. 24 7 World Radio. This is the Eric John Phelps Show on 24 7 World Radio. This is 24 7 World Radio, and you're listening to the Eric John Phelps Show. Jesuits by Wiley, continuing on Ireland, the many maladies and its one cure. Of these landlords, they had bought their properties as a profitable investment and a profitable investment they intended to make them. Quote, they bought cheap, unquote, says Mr. Froud, that great English historian. Quote, because the land was burdened with paupers, they flung them out to sink or swim, to live or die, where a tenant by his own labor, had drained and fenced, had built cabin and cattle shed, and had made bog or mountain grow grass to feed cows. His rent was raised on him, or he too was ordered to go. This is typical Jesuit policy, because no true Protestant would do this. Remember, Jesuits disguised themselves as Protestants. So just because a guy carries the label of a Protestant doesn't mean he's one. You've got to tell him by his works, as Christ said, you know them by the fruit. And this would further enrage the Irish Catholics against the Protestants, not knowing that the Protestants that were in their presence were really working for the Jesuits or co Jesuit co -adjutors. And the government of, of uh, the parliament in England was in the hands of the papists of the Jesuit order, afflicting the Irish people. I'll show you why he even says something like this later on. So he goes on and he says, page 118. Further, it was a tremendous error on the part of the Irish nation to permit itself to become dependent for the staple of its subsistence on one single root, the potato. This was a short-sightedness which none but savages, one would think, could have fallen into. The awful consequences were seen when the potato disease broke out in 1846. When that calamity visited Ireland, there were believed to be nearly nine millions of inhabitants in it. Of these, there were two millions who did not possess so much as a potato field and who even in ordinary years had to be supported by charity. In 1846, the food of three-fourths of the population was suddenly swept away. And few tragedies, even in the tragic history of Ireland, are so appalling as that which followed. Of the Irish people, some millions had to flee to America, and some millions more without food and water, the means of emigrating, succumb without, without food and water and without the means of emigrating, succumbed to the famine and sunk into the grave. Now that's a Jesuit harvest, reducing the population of Catholic Ireland, driving millions at least a million to America to take place of power in the North. And that's exactly what the Jesuits said they would do in their notorious meeting in Buffalo in 1852, which I quote in Father Chinnicky's work, 50 years in the Church of Rome. You go on. Down page 119, down to the middle of the 20th century, Ireland maintained both its ecclesiastical and its political independence. Down to the middle of the 12th century, Ireland maintained both its ecclesiastical and its political independence. Its people were governed by the descendants of their ancient kings, and its church neither professed the creed nor submitted to the jurisdiction of Rome. 
That's the middle of the 12th century. Who robbed it of this independence? The Catholic Irish do not care to hear of this affair, but history makes no secret of it. The man who enslaved Ireland was the Pope. He usurped the rights of its church. He usurped the rights of its Irish church. It had no connection to the papacy and its temple power. And he brought in the arms of a foreign power to crush its civil independence. This is called internal conspiracy on the part of the bishops inside the country and then to be topped off with a foreign invasion, exactly as what's being done here in America. We have complete and total treason on the part of this military government in Washington since March 9, 1933, to weaken us, to sicken us, to bankrupt us, to use our high technology to give to communist Russia and communist China in preparation for our future invasion. This is what the papacy does. This is what it did in Ireland. Breakspeare, Adrian IV, Pope Adrian IV, the one English name in the role of the world's worst tyrants. In virtue of being God's vice regent, that means the Pope, and Lord Paramount of all the kingdoms of Christendom, that's his doctrine of temporal power, claimed Ireland as his own, or in papal phraseology, part of the patrimony of Peter, by a bull dated A.D. 1155. He next sold it to Henry II of England on condition that he should pay a penny a year for each house in the kingdom. That's known as Peter's Pence. The Pope sold Ireland and all the people in it and all the land in it to the King of England, who is a Roman Catholic. Irish people, your problem is the Pope and your Catholic oppressors of the past in England, not the English Protestants. And that includes Cromwell. I'll add this. You realize when Cromwell conquered Ireland after the Irish had been viciously murdering the Protestant children and people in the Irish massacre, killing in excess of 100,000 of them in eight years, more like 300,000. When Cromwell went up there, he put his son-in-law, Lieutenant General Ireton, in charge. And for five years, Ireland enjoyed peace and prosperity until the Jesuits poisoned Ireton. They would later poison Cromwell. But Ireland, you prospered under Cromwell. And don't say, talk about Wexford and Drahida, Drahida. They could have surrendered, but they refused at the behest of the priests. So all that you've suffered is a result of the priests, not because of Cromwell or the English Protestants. Go on. The English king so far had been so very exemplary son of the church, had been, no very, had been no very exemplary son of the church, but now he crouched down before the pontiff and consented to hold Ireland as a fife of the papal see. Just like the commander-in-chief of Washington, D.C. is holding America as a fife, as, a, as property of the Pope of Rome that he serves. And it doesn't matter if the commander-in-chief is a Democrat or Republican because they all go see that man of sin in Rome. You see how history repeats itself? Because the doctrines of the papacy never change. And so those that implement those doctrines have a continual history, a history that doesn't change. Going on. says, these men, seeing in the affair the prospect of a vast accession of riches and dignities to themselves, that's the bishops in Ireland, entered into secret negotiations with Henry, and before their countrymen were aware that the Pope had sold them to the English monarch and that the bishops were preparing to betray the liberties of the country, the latter had opened the gates of Ireland to the soldiers of England. Invasion! This is what they're doing here! Why do you think Clinton leased Long Beach to the Red Chinese? Going on. We have this history of what happened. Quote, and this is in the Dublin e Evening Mail. It was on the evening of the 23rd of August, 1172, 1171, 
that the first hostile English footstep pressed the soil of Ireland. And they're all Roman Catholics, by the way. Roman Catholic English coming in Ireland. And it's said to have been a sweet and mild evening when the invading party entered the noble estuary formed by the conflicts of the Sewer, the Nori, and Barrow at the city of Waterford. A curse to be that day in the memory of all future generations of Irishmen when the invaders first touched our shores. Exclamation point. They came to a nation famous for its love of learning, its piety, and its heroism. They came when internal dissension separated her sons and wasted their energies. That's called civil war. Inside agitations to facilitate invasion and then subjugation. Internal traitors led on the invaders. Her sons fell in no fight. Her liberties were crushed in no battle. But domestic treason and foreign invaders doomed Ireland to seven centuries of oppression. And that's what these sinners are dooming us to right now in America. We're on the verge of this. Continual high treason with a subsequent invasion, as I warned about 20 years in my book, Vatican Assassins. Going on. You read. Ireland, it is true, was no longer a highly civilized and Christian, that's Bible reading, country it had been in the 7th and 8th centuries. It had been first desolated and next barbarized by the frequent incursions of the northern corsairs in the 9th and 10th centuries. Nevertheless, it still enjoyed a measure of rude freedom, broken only by the feuds of its rival petty chieftains. But now new elements of discord were introduced. The expectations of no one of the three parties who had been concerned in the great original wrong does the country done the country were fully realized. The English king was not able to conquer and occupy Ireland. The Pope's tribute was not regularly paid. And although lands, abbeys, and cathedral seats, in short, wealth in every form was lavishly poured on the clergy. Yep. Their boundless desires were not satiated, and Ireland became the battleground of three powerful and hostile parties who fiercely warred against one another, but were united in their hostility to the Irish people, who were trodden down into dire slavery and unspeakable misery. The remains of the early Christian Church of Ireland were crushed out. Its adherents were driven into remote wilds of the country and finally disappeared in the universal submission of the nation to the yoke of Rome. There followed a night of ignorance so dark that even the memory of the Irish primitive church, that's the Bible-believing Irish primitive church, was lost. They lost the memory of it. And Ireland came to believe that she had always been in communion with the Romish Sea. Goes on. Page 122. Such is a brief but truthful history of Ireland for four centuries. The great source of Irish misery has been, says Dr. Phelan, quote, not the power of England, but its want of power, the want of power to maintain some sort of order. We go on. Now we come to the Reformation. England threw off the yoke of Rome from her own neck. And we would have expected to see her use wise endeavors to break that yoke from off the neck of her sister kingdom, seeing they were her own soldiers who had so largely assisted to rivet it. England, now reformed and Protestant, had a grand opportunity presented to her of atoning for her great crime and taking part with the Pope in plunging Ireland into darkness. Overjoyed, she might have been to recompense his poor people for the ages of suffering that had passed over them since that, quote, sweet and mild evening, quote, unquote, in 7, 1171, when her soldiers first landed on their shore by kindling among them the lamp of the gospel. England herself being judge, and that she had renounced the popish faith as, quote, idolatrous and damnable, unquote, would in so acting have been bestowing on Ireland both a temporal and eternal salvation. In other words, bring the gospel to Ireland, Protestant England. Apologize for what you did to it in 1171. What a different future would have been in store for both herself and her sister country. What a prosperity and splendor would have been the lot of both islands had England seized the golden opportunity. She would have cured the vice inherent in the first connection of the two countries 
and wiping from the memories of both nations the crimes and the miseries that had flowed from it, she would have established a new and eternal union between herself and Ireland at the altar of a common faith, Bible-based Protestant faith and Baptist. Steps in that direction England did not take, but viewed in the light of the occasion and of the solemn responsibilities she had incurred to the Irish people, they were glaringly inadequate. She neither, with few exceptions, sent the right men, nor took the right methods, nor went about the matter in the right spirit, nor adopted the right scale, and I would add, except under Cromwell. To plant the Reformation in Ireland was worth the forethought, the money, the labor with which kingdoms are established. In truth, there was no conquest in all the earth, not even that of the largest and richest continent on the globe, which would have so recompensed England as she would have been recompensed by the diffusion of the faith of the Bible, and that's the Reformation Bible, among the Irish people. But alas, the littlenesses, the intrigues, the selfishness, the worldliness, which had poisoned the whole intercourse of the two countries since their connection began, desecrated an effort which, if it was to succeed, must stand forth, not only unpolluted by these stains, but pure and holy beyond the measure of all other causes. The unhappy consequence has been that Ireland is a popish, as popish at this day as it ever was, and that it is more under the dominancy of the hierarchy than during the calumnious era which we have rapidly traced. This is the great sin of which England has been guilty, although the agitator is silent respecting it, and we never find a catalog in the list of wrongs, injustices, and oppressions which Great Britain is alleged to have inflicted on the sister island. Lesser iniquities are held up to scathing reprobation, but no order ennobles his eloquence or sanctifies and sublimes the passions which he seeks to rouse by holding up to righteous condemnation this parent iniquity, this deep and everlasting wrong, and that's to not get the gospel and a Bible into every household of Ireland. And this is J.C. Wiley. It goes on, talks about the Irish massacre until Cromwell came up, 1641-1649. And the purpose was the extinction of the Protestant faith in Ireland, led by Jesuits and their papal nobles, the O'Neills. And so the author... Um, fairly much concludes here. We have a remedy to propose, but it is by far too simple to find favor in the eyes of our politicians and our philosophers. Putting a Bible into the hands of an Indian prince, Queen Vic our queen, that's Victoria, is said to have accompanied the gift with the words, quote, this is the source of England's greatness, unquote. Is this a truth? And do we believe it? then give a free Bible and a free school to every family in Ireland. And let us take good care that no priest shall have it in his power to nullify the gift by placing the fetter of anathema upon the Bible and the seal of interdict upon the school. Till we do this, we are but pouring the resources of our legislation, of our philanthropy, and our money into a bottomless pit. Daisy Quiley, Jesuits, 1881. The papacy is the source of the Irish degradation of today. And we'll continue to talk about this in our second hour with Brother Sean Hanlon as he comes to us live from Ireland today. We'll be back in a moment with Eric John Phelps, 24-7 World Radio.